Okay, now it's uh, four o'clock. Our event will begin on time. Uh, distinguished guests, dear friends, and audience online, good afternoon. I'm Shirley, Director of CCG Publishing Center. Today is our great honor to host this book launch in CCG headquarters. This book is authored by Professor Carrie Brown with a title, uh, China Through European Eyes, 800 Years of Culture and Intellectual Encounter. Before we further explore this encounter, please let me to introduce our distinguished guests. Uh, Carrie Brown, Professor of Chinese Studies and Director of the Low China Institution at King's College London. Professor Brown is online from UK. And uh, Angela Lisidong, uh, Assistant Director of World Scientific Publishing. Angela is online from Singapore. Hello, Angela. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. And uh, Chao Weibing, um, yeah. President and Editor-in-Chief of China Translation and Publishing House. As I know, uh, Mr. Cho is a very famous publisher in Chinese publishing industry. Uh, he has a very brilliant career. Uh, in the past, uh, as I know, you have been uh, the Editor-in-Chief of one of China's most famous uh, publishing house, that is City, City Press. Before that, uh, he is the vice editor in chief of uh, China uh, business or economic or business uh, publishing house. Now um, he's in charge of uh, uh, China translation and uh, China translation publishing house and published many best sellers. As I know, last year, the most uh, famous book in Chinese market is uh, Metaverse, is published by Mr. Chao. Thank you, Ms. Chow, for introducing to us uh, so good books. And here is Dr. Wang Huiyao, president of CCG. And thank you all without your contribution. I think it's impossible to make happen today's book release and a future the Chinese edition release. Uh, my special thanks want to go to Dr. Wang uh, thank you for supporting my department, CCG Publishing Center, to translate this book into Chinese. I hope to invite you to give an opening remark. Please, Dr. Wang. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Shirley. And uh, so, uh, good afternoon, uh, Carrie, and also good, af uh, good morning, Carrie, and good afternoon, Angela. And of course, uh, uh, so, so also thanks, uh, uh, Minister Chao uh, uh, also attending our event today. So we are very honored and house to you know promote and actually introduce the, the latest new book by uh, uh, Professor Carrie Brown, uh, China Through the European Eyes, 800 Years of a Cultural and Intellectual Encounter. So this is really a very uh, new book, but in a sense that uh, new that we have uh, analyzed and uh, and also uh, discussed uh, many uh, you know philosophies, uh, you know well known figures, uh, highly intellectual uh, uh, you know scholars in the history of, of Europe, and then on their uh, encounter and their uh, uh, you know studies on China statement as well. So. Uh, Professor Carol Brown has made uh, uh, very great efforts in going through the, all the literature and <laughs> really uh, digging out uh, those very uh, impressive, uh, very uh, relevant, I mean, highly relevant today uh, for this uh, uh, European uh, views on China, you know, China through the European eyes. I think it's really a great title of that. Uh, so Center for China Globalization is really uh, very uh, uh, committed to promote uh, uh, mutual understanding, of course, uh, uh, common understanding between China and outside world. And European has always been a, a fascinating uh, continent and uh, has a rich history, has a, a lot of uh, uh, hu human uh, humanity and, and uh, re re renaissance and uh, enlightenment, uh, you know, in, in a contribution to the history of mankind. 
uh, so so we are very uh, happy that uh, uh, you know the the uh, the this new book has been now published uh, uh, in English world now, and uh, so I think also our, our timing is very good. We we are now seeing a big uh, a crisis happening in Ukraine, you know that uh, has got all the world attention, and uh, so also there's a huge interest in China to know more about European history. And uh, and also its development. So this this book actually uh, just uh, released uh, now is giving a very good account of what uh, European uh, uh, well-known scholars, historically historians and uh, philosophers and uh, uh, great uh, 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 artists, you know, what their views on China. And uh, so so I think it helps to promote uh, the understanding uh, of, of of the these European uh, countries and chi China, and of course also. For Chinese to understand what, uh, how historically, uh, European thinks on China and uh, and how they, you know, uh, the look at the China uh, through the historically European eyes. So, so this is absolutely fascinating book. Uh, so we will we will hear more later we will from uh, Carrie uh, uh, of his uh, latest uh, book. But also we we are, we are also very happy to have invited the uh, uh, President Chao uh, to attend because. His, his publishing house is called China Translating Press, which is one of the best press uh, publishing has in the press in China. And this book has uh, uh, already been translated by CCG and will be uh, uh, published uh, by Mr. Chow's publishing house. Uh, that's why we are inviting him <laughs> to come today uh, to witness this English uh, uh, release here in China. And of course, we, we, we are very, uh, thank you for, for, for Angela, uh, 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 Angela Dong for, for the scientific uh, publishing, which is really uh, uh, have a very unique, uh, uh, you know, views or unique uh, 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 eyes of, of, of choosing this book uh, for, the, for the English world. So, so, so but, uh, but I think, you know, uh, as a, a center for China, as a Chinese translator for this book, we are, we are very happy and very Pleased to to co-organize co this uh, uh, publishing event with our uh, partner in Singapore, uh, Scientific Publishing. So, uh, so, so now I I will just give a brief uh, comment here, and then uh, we we'll hear uh, more from our uh, keynote today and also our publisher uh, as well. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wang. Thank you for your remark. And now I want to invite uh, Angela Lisi Dong to give a speech from the publisher's perspective, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me share the screen. So, um, can you see the screen now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, dear President Wang Huiya and President uh, Xiao Weiming, dear Professor Carrie Brown, um, and also Shelley, um, I'm so honored to join you this afternoon on behalf of World Scientific Publishing. And uh, World Scientific is very proud to have published Professor Kerry Brown's book, China Through European Eyes, 800 Years of Cultural and Intellectual Encounter. And I also appreciate that uh, Center for China and Globalization have uh, devoted so much time and energy to translating this book into Chinese and appreciate uh, President Xiao Weibing and your team from China Publish uh, Translation Publishing House to publish a Chinese version. Okay, so this book, China Through European Eyes, 800 Years of Cultural and Intellectual Encounter, provides a unique reader's perspective on the conceptualization of China by Europeans. It is a valuable collection of main writings of 16 key European figures from a time of Marco Polo. Those are the figures who, whose ideas and views have the long lasting impact on European culture. And this book also showcases the long history of interaction between Chinese and Europeans. The ideas and views from this book also provides inspirations for us in today and even for future um, the communication and engagement between Europe and China, and also for the dialogue between East and West. Uh, Professor Braun is one of the top China study experts in the world. 
And actually, this is also the fifth book we published for him. And uh, thanks his unremitting efforts. He is very prolific writer. He published many books and enabled the English world readers to have a deeper and better understanding of China, Chinese people, and Chinese culture. So Pro Professor Brown uh, is not just an author, and he's one of the serious editors of our book series, China's Belt and Road Initiative. And he's also editorial board member of our journal, China Quarterly of International Strategic Studies. As President Bon just mentioned, World Scientific have a unique value preparation. We focus on contemporary China studies. We have published more than 800 books uh, related to China, China's business management, economics, finance, politics, and international relations. Um, but China study is not just the one core area for us. In fact, we have a very diversified publishing program. Um, okay, I, I would like to take this opportunity to briefly introduce our company to you as well. So World Scientific is a leading international scientific academic publisher. The company was founded in 1981 in Singapore. This is uh, our headquarter building, and I would like to invite you to visit our company in the future. Currently, we have 12 overseas offices, and we have global presence in 115 countries through our offline and online distribution channels. We publish 600 new titles and 140 journals annually. Our key subjects include physics, math, computer science, medical science, business and management, economics and finance. We also publish a lot of books for high uh, level scholars like Nobel laureates, Wolf Prize winners, and uh, Professor Kerr Brown and many other China experts and China watchers. And many books have been adopted by prestigious universities worldwide including Harvard, Yale, King's College London, and Peking University, Tsinghua University, and many others. So our mission is to develop the highest quality of knowledge-based products and services for the academic, scientific, professional research and student communities worldwide. We are committed to developing and publishing uh, high quality books to disseminate knowledge to connecting scholars from East West. And we look forward to publishing more quality books for Professor Kerry Brown. And we also look forward to more collaboration with Center for China and Globalization and China Pub uh, Translation and Publishing House. Um, these are the, our books. And thank you so much for your time and attention. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Angela. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I myself work in the publishing industry for many years. As I know, it's really not easy to publish a book full of uh, historical knowledge and uh, accept from famous works. So please convey my thanks to your uh, hard work editorial team. Uh, Thank tell you. them Thank we you. in CCG love this book. And I Thank believe you. more Chinese readers will love this book too. Thank you, Angela. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, now um, let me invite uh, the author, Professor Kerry Brown from King's College London to release his new book. As I know, um, Professor Brown has many years experience in China and also wrote over 20 books on China. Thank you so much for your research and study on China. Please, Professor Brown. Great, thank you. <clears throat> uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be with you today. I'd like to thank Dr. Wang for all of his continuing support and his great collaboration over the last few years since we met, I think, uh, with Chatham House and a delegation in Beijing and at the Schwarzman College uh, three or four years ago now. So that was a, a happy meeting and uh, we've continued very happy collaboration since and for the work of the um, organisation uh, the Centre for China and Globalisation, which I think is more and more important now. I'd also like to thank my publishers, Well Scientific. I've worked with this publisher since, I believe, 2010, 2011, and published uh, several books and always been very happy experience. So I am very happy that we can continue our collaboration. Uh, we keep on hearing about how <clears throat> China 
and Europe are always trying to find out about each other and understand each other. But this is not a new issue. Europe has known China and China has been uh, engaged with Europe for many hundreds of years. Indeed, you could say the very earliest were the Portuguese, who of course uh, colonized Macau for many hundreds of years until it's returned to China in 1999. But from then you had Dutch, British, French, and others come. Some of them uh, came in the issue uh, in the spirit of collaboration, some of them less happily. But the main thing was that China and Europe certainly have a lot of knowledge about each other and have a, a very big impact upon each other. And their mutual histories are deeply involved with each other. It's important, this book is really just a selection and it's a selection of 16 key figures. And I chose these figures with my co-author, uh, Gemma Chungaradung, um, because they are significant figures in their own right. People like Leibniz, uh, a great Enlightenment philosopher, people like Voltaire, an important, again, Enlightenment political scientist and philosopher and writer, people like uh, Montesquieu, who had a huge impact with his writings on the establishment of the United States political system through the spirit of the laws, people like Karl Marx, of course, enormously important in China and in Europe, who did write about China. And then people in the 20th century, like Max Weber, the philosopher Bertrand Russell, the French philosopher Simone de Beauvoir, and then the later figures, which I have in the book, Julia Kristeva and Roland Barthes, French philosophers. These are not figures who we associate with China necessarily. Uh, Hegel, who I also have a selection from, wrote about many other things and was the inspiration for some of Karl Marx's most important ideas. But they did specifically address the issue of China and its uniqueness. And I thought I would say a few words about why China was so unique and important for Europeans. We have to remember at the very beginning of the encounter between China and Europe, Europe was a predominantly Christian civilization. And the belief was that the world was only I think 4,000, 5,000 years old. It had been created by God in the book of Genesis uh, with a definite time, which was a few thousand years before. And one of the great puzzles for Europeans when they learned about Chinese civilization was the idea that there had been a civilization in China which seemed to be older than the history of the world. <laughs> and they struggled with this idea. How was it possible that you had a world created only a few thousand years ago, but then there seemed to be this civilization, the other side of the world, as far away as from you as possible, which predated this. This was a big, big problem. Yesterday, I was in the British Library reading a book from 1668 by a, John, by a British writer, John Webb. In 1668, I don't think any British person had written about going to China, actually physically gone to China. Certainly Jesuits from Portugal and Italy had gone to China, but no British people, I think, had actually been recorded as going to China by that point. Uh, that didn't happen till later. There may have been tradespeople who accidentally went there, but I don't think there's any record of these. John Webb wrote in this book in 1668 about how the original language of the world, the very first language that humans spoke, must be Chinese. He said that this was the case because records from China went back so far. They went back beyond the Hebrew language, they went back beyond ancient Greek and ancient Latin, that it must be the original language of mankind. Of course, this wasn't the case, as we know, the two language families that humans speak now, there is the Chinese on one side and then the non-Chinese languages on the other, they're quite distinctive. But I think it showed a big, big struggle to understand this radically new, different culture, but a culture that people actually found much to admire. We now have much scholarship that shows that figures like Leibniz profoundly thought about Confucianism and what the ethical and moral system in China offered. 
and how that had a deep impact on Enlightenment thinking. And I think that we need to remember today this important lesson that the Enlightenment had figures who were key in it, who did think hard about what Chinese philosophy and Chinese culture meant. And that figures a lot in many, many different writers, many more than the ones I've included here. Of course, after that point, as Europe industrialized, as the economic structure changed, the relationship became very, very different. Of course, in the 19th century, there became uh, huge issues of conflict and difference and a kind of divergence. But I think we might take inspiration from these early hundreds of years of the relationship between China and Europe to think of ways in which we did often in the past work more harmoniously and have more curiosity about each other. And I think that that's the most important lesson from looking at the important figures in this book. They did have a strong sense of curiosity and a willingness to learn from Chinese writers when they had access. Today, we have wonderful translations. We have great access to different writers from Chinese history. We have many studies and centers in Europe which specifically look at China. And I think that that should give us a great foundation to continue this mutual education uh, to which this book is uh, a small contribution, I hope. Uh, its main function is to put together these key figures so that we can have access to them more easily and think a bit about how over 800 years, but specifically over the last four or 500 years, Europe's history has been often one that has involved China. And I think China's history is one that often has involved Europeans. And I think that that is a fundamental uh, lesson that we need to remember now and bear in mind in the future. Uh, again, I thank my co-author, uh, Gemma chang uh, and I thank the editors and my other assistants and helpers for all of the work that they put into this and the Center for China and Globalization for the uh, wonderful support they've given. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Brown. Uh, actually, it's a very interesting and a unique book because uh, when we translate it, we find uh, almost uh, all the famous works by these uh, well-known authors have been published in Chinese uh, many years ago, but never before have an uh, author to yeah, pick them up and uh, select uh, the accepts and put together on the topic of China, on China. So it's very interesting. It's a unique perspective, yeah, to come to, accompanying this book. It's really interesting. And uh, we in China, we uh, can't wait for the Chinese edition can be published uh, at an uh, early date. That's why today, uh, Mr. Chow from the uh, China uh, Translation and Publishing House was invited to the uh, book launch. Ms. Chow is one of the best uh, publishers in China. It was a br very brilliant career. So I believe with uh, his efforts, this book will be warmly welcomed by Chinese readers. And I ho also hope it can be sold very well, Mr. Cho. So I hope you sharing your thoughts on this book and its Chinese edition. Please. So today we are so honored and very happy together with uh, Dr. Wang and also the CCG has done a lot to the contribution to the publishing, to the translation of this book, this wonderful book. The book authored by Professor Carrie Brown is very distinguished and also very honorable. And I myself also personally feel very honored to be here. And recently we've noticed a lot of efforts done by the World Scientific Publishing in Singapore. And you have published a lot of books 
good books, bestsellers. So today we had a very good chance to have Angela together with uh, us on this dialogue, and it is my personal honor uh, to meet Angela in person as well. And also Carrie Brown, Professor per Carrie Brown. Carrie Brown is a very tall person, basically. And, uh, and he's been in engaged in China for so long time. Yes. And also we have a very long history of cooperation. And I've been working uh, in the press for this year. But before that, I was working for CITIC uh, Publishing Press. And I also had the honor and respons uh, responsible for publishing one of your book as well. And we learn a lot from the publishing of that book as well, and many, many books has been published, have been published in China. So it is our honor. And I remember the former body of my organization is uh, China um, Publishing House, which is basically translating and uh, publishing the foreign uh, titles books uh, into China and uh, publish them then circulate them into China in China's market to reach China's readership. And we've uh, been engaged with a lot of uh, foreign books. And also many of them are very excellent. And Carrie Brown's book is one of them. And these are very good and the best sellers in China. And the CCG, this of this book, China Through European Eyes. 800 Years of Culture and Intellectual Encounter. This book was translated by CCG and Dr. Wang and um, Angela have done a very great job in supporting the translation and the publishing of this book. In the second half, of 2022, we are going to publish the uh, more books because we think that the critical issue in here is uh, to let uh, Chinese stories be told uh, and introduce them into the world and let the world people to know China, to know Chinese history. And these kind of books are very good window through which the foreigners can understand better about China and uh, countries of different kinds enjoying different cultures and different backgrounds. So we think that books is the best bridge um, to connect with people and uh, to promote the mutual understanding. So this book is so good, very timely one. And, and I remember there is another book and that book is also very, very good. It's book is about telling Chinese life, life a tale of five cities. And that book tells uh, the very uh, vivid life of Chinese people uh, in the cities. And this book is even better because of this is talking about the 800 years of history, the 800 years of history. So is it possible that the stories after 1970s, the big issues happening in China can be introduced to Europe and uh, what perspectives taken by European people about China after 1970s. So probably is it possible that you can publish something like that uh, into a book so that we can publish a book like that? And uh, I heard Dr. Wang said that the um, Patterns of the international relations between countries have changed fundamentally, especially the conflicts and wars between Ukraine and Russia has a lot of implications in the future, which will be very prolonged. So we think that we have to reshuffle our perspectives in looking into the relations between East and West. So possibly, Carrie Brown, we really want to invite you to write more things about the current things, uh, the current uh, European perspectives about China, uh, especially after 1970s and 80s and all the way till now. Thank you, Mr. Cho. And uh, I 
think you want to uh, publish the, the next book of Professor Brown. And uh, also Professor Brown, do you have answer to uh, Mr. Charles' question? Yeah, um, I think if we had gone beyond 1970s, the book would have been very, very big. <laughs> uh, I think it's because until the 1970s, it was, um, there, there were very limited people who, who came to China. China was still more remote. And so for Western European intellectuals to write about China, it was a very big choice. You know, there are many other things they could write about, and most of them hadn't visited. I mean, in this book, the ones that had visited were Simon de Beauvoir, Julia Kristeva, Roland Barthes, um, Bertrand Russell, and then the other writers, if I remember rightly, um, apart from the uh, travelers in the 19th century, didn't visit. They wrote about China from afar. But really, since the 1970s, after the opening up of China, almost every major intellectual figure in Europe has, has visited China. I mean, uh, Jacques Derrida, the, the, the French philosopher, um, you, you know, kind of um, the, the, the German um, uh, kind of thinkers. I, I mean, um, Anthony Giddens, the British, uh, I suppose you call it sociologist. I, I mean, everyone has sort of visited. And so it's kind of quite difficult to select what they would have written. Um, much of what they would have written would have not been um, easy to sort of, you know, kind of manage. There would have been a lot of new material. So I just thought 1970s at least meant we got up to the, you know, kind of opening up and reform period. And maybe there will be a second book when we can look at after 1978, because that is a different kind of period. Uh, and so that might be a project I can work on in the future. Uh, thank you, Professor Brown. And uh, uh, Dr. Wang, do you have something to share about? Uh, yeah. Yes. His <clears throat> no, no. I, I, I heard. Uh, I, absolutely, I heard. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Carrie, uh, you know, have made a great uh, presentation of, of his latest book, uh, which is very, very significant. And also, uh, I'm very thankful for. Uh, World Scientific Publishing House uh, for you know published the English version and also thank uh, uh, President Chao for trans you know publishing the translating in uh, in Chinese. Uh, so I think this this book is really a highly relevant time. You know I, I agree with Carrie. You know that we look at uh, past eight hundred years uh, uh, of uh, what European eyes uh, uh, through the European eyes on China, but that that gives a lot of uh, uh, reflection. Of historically view China, and of course, also there's a great changes have taken place uh, in the last 40, 50 years. Also, that as actually, uh, as Carrie mentioned, could be the next project. But I think uh, it's just uh, it's before this 1970s. I think there is really a gap uh, that uh, China and exchange with the outside world. So, with those prominent uh, historical figures, that they have actually. Uh, 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 talk about China and uh, and uh, also uh, discovered China and also really emphasized China. That really shows the the the, the heritage, the, the tradition, the you know that uh, the, the the attention that uh, European has been given to China. And I, I'm also uh, very glad to hear that Carrie mentioned that you went to the library and you saw this uh, uh, one of the earliest language of of course Chinese was. Uh, uh, so the civilization of the both Chinese civilization and European civilizations are, are, are two longest civilizations and, and, and with others as well. So, so I think that it's important we, we revive this kind of, a, 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 both from historical and, uh, and realistic uh, at the present time, uh, to look at, at, at old angles, old, old, old backgrounds, and particularly I think there's a revival of the historical a rediscovery of, of Chinese uh, uh, history, culture, and also uh, viewed by the historian and his philosophy enlighteners uh, in the history of European. So, so this is really great, uh, 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 you know, that occasion and also a, a very timely and also through the very good, uh, this book, uh, very uh, structured, uh, uh, particularly single out all their China, uh, 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 statement and writings, it's really a, a great job. So, so I, again, I want to congratulate uh, uh, World Scientific Publishing House and of course the 
the author Carrie Brown and your co-author for uh, making this available at this time because China and the European relations probably uh, at uh, also uh, all time high the importance Yet there's a lot of misunderstanding. There could be mistrust, and so it's important that we we have more uh, discussions uh, and more uh, you know tracing of the history views and historical views. And also, of course, as as uh, uh, Mr. Chow mentioned, that we have to look at the current <laughs> uh, last 40, 50 years. So really, we need a, a lot of a cultural dialogue and uh, exchanges and philosophical thinking and. Uh, so that we may find that there's a lot of common, common ground, a lot of common uh, uh, tradition, heritage, and then maybe we can set up a new understanding, a new narrative and, uh, and an acceptance of, of each other and also work out uh, for the human beings uh, uh, future together. So, so this is really a great book uh, that CCG is highly recommend. So I'll stop here, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wang. Uh, in my hand now, there are some questions from media. Uh, the first question is for Professor Brown, but uh, I hope uh, President Cho and Dr. Wang also can share your thoughts because I think this question should talk on both sides. The question is, as a British expert on Chinese issues, you has in-depth research and reflections on China's development and China-UK relations, which have been very well reflected in your engrossing books such as China Life, a Tale of Five Cities. This year, 2022, marks the 15th anniversary of the establishment of uh, diplomatic relations between China and the UK, standing at a new historic uh, starting point. What's your perspective on the bilateral relations between the two countries? And how can the two sides increase dialogue and exchange? as well as expand uh, mutual beneficial cooperation. This question is from uh, China Today. Great. Um, yeah, so the 50th anniversary of uh, ambassadorial level relations was only um, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago. Um, in fact, Britain recognized the People's Republic of China on January the 6th, 1950. So I think it was the second or third European country to recognize the People's Republic soon after its foundation in 1949. Um, Britain did so because of its interest in Hong Kong at the time, but we were certainly one of the earliest and we had a, um, a representation in China in the 1950s, indeed all the way through the last, um, the, the history of the People's Republic. Uh, our embassy originally was uh, next to Tiananmen Square uh, in the old legation district in Beijing. And then in 1956, it moved to Guanghualu, where it remains to this day. So we have a long history and we know each other well. Indeed, uh, it, you know, Britain's embassies to China, which started in the 1790s, um, were, had a permanent presence in Beijing from uh, 1860. So this is a long, quite a long history. What can we do for the future? Um, I mean, I think we have to understand much better what we mean to each other and how we figure in each other's worlds, which is why I think the history is important. We don't, as British people, probably think about our history as much maybe as Chinese people. And I think we need to think about how we worked together in the past and how even in very difficult times, we always found ways of cooperating. I mean, even in the Cold War, in the very kind of midst of the Cold War in the early 1960s, Rolls-Royce and other companies were active in China. And I think Rolls-Royce was active from 1961 in China. Um, Shell and BP were active, had uh, uh, kind of offices in China, Standard Chartered, HSBC. We always work together. We always work together. And I think that's really important. The second thing I think is that we now have very big common area, actually. It's strange that there's so much argument uh, between America, Europe, China. Um, actually, there's big areas of agreement. We don't disagree on climate change. We don't really disagree on 
actually managing pandemics. I mean, we know pandemics are things we've got to stop, even if we do it in different ways. We actually agree that nuclear proliferation is a problem. We actually agree a lot on, uh, you know, kind of how to try and deal with sustainability. Um, we collaborate on all sorts of areas of public health. Uh, my own college does a big nursing collaboration in Nanjing. Well, we have a lot of common areas, and I think we talk too much about our differences. We actually really do work a lot together. Uh, so I think uh, in the future, we need to remember how much we've worked over many hundreds of years, not just decades, over hundreds of years, and how important that joint work was. And of course, there are differences, significant differences sometimes, but they are not the decisive thing. Uh, the fact is that we work in increasingly common frameworks. The UK has a unique history. Britain has a unique history with China. Some of it was not so good. Some of it was good. Uh, a lot of it we've forgotten. And I hope that our work uh, together can remind people of how much we know about each other and how much we have worked. Finally, um, when I'm being researching history, how much have I kind of learned that Britain and China have always collaborated in learning about each other? We would never have understood China without the enormous effort and help of Chinese translators, Chinese scholars, Chinese who moved to Britain, like students, scholars, other experts, and collaboration like this. We always need to collaborate. And I'm sure that many Brit British people moved to China, worked in China, uh, worked in companies, worked in schools. We would not understand each other without help from each other. I think this, is, this history of collaboration has often been forgotten, but we have collaborated way more than we have had conflict. And Britain and China, I think, need to remember that. Our history of collaboration is far, far bigger than our history of conflict and disagreement. Thank you, uh, Professor Brown. I have re read your essay contributed to uh, another book of CCG's uh, Consensus or Conflict. From that essay, as I know, now in the UK, not many, not Many, many people who know Chinese very well, like an expert, some that don't uh, have a, a, a very, very good understanding of this country. So we do need experts uh, like you to, yeah, to promote the understanding of the both countries and uh, hope we have a better cooperation and better future between the two countries. And uh, President Cho, do you have uh, suggestions on this topic? Thank you, moderator. After listening to the response to this question from Professor Brown, I felt very emotional. And so I felt something in common. And I was talking with uh, Dr. Wang before this dialogue, talking about how to explore the future possibility of uh, cooperation in the future. And uh, I'd like to uh, frame my thoughts about the publishing the books. So this book selected 16 scholars in Europe, their thoughts and their literatures and their framing and their language describing China. And the two aspects are very important. One experiencer, the other is observer. The understanding actually about these two kinds of intellectuals are very, very important because some misconcept is based on the misunderstanding about China and the China history. So I think from the perspectives of the historical intellectuals and the figures to read and to understand China and to make judgment about China is very valuable. At the same time, about the readerships and also to the question from online, I think that we have to select the perspective of looking into the future. Also, Angela, 
from the World Scientific Publishing House. They are also focusing on the titles of the science and of the uh, uh, sociology of the nature and of finance and economic development and so on and so forth. Also, CCG has uh, translated and promoted a lot of uh, bestsellers and uh, very intellectual books. And the Carrie Brown professor is a very renowned professor, intellectual. And uh, my press is uh, also a kind of a bridge connecting the East and West by knowledge sharing. So I think that it is a very good and a common area for our future cooperation. For example, uh, Professor Brown and the CCG, we can somehow select 16 or even 32 uh, modern time intellectuals and scholars and select their thoughts in a kind of a series of books or a one title uh, to observe China or experience China to share with the world about their thoughts about China. I think that is also more practical. Very good, excellent. And Dr. Wang? Yeah, no, I just want to add, uh, you know, very well, I think what uh, uh, Carrie has just mentioned, uh, and also uh, uh, President Chow. And uh, uh, so what, what I think is actually uh, uh, Great Britain, I mean, and China has a long history now. And, uh, and, uh, and, and then I, 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 I remember, you know, the, uh, you know, one, there, there's so many people learning English. I mean, when I learned to follow me, I mean, that was uh, from the UK. Uh, uh, you know, in my childhood time. So, so there was, uh, was such a great uh, uh, tradition uh, that uh, has been exchanges. Uh, I think one thing, I, 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 as uh, uh, the uh, uh, Carrie mentioned, the, the, the business community actually is, is very, very strong. So, so this is actually, uh, UK now is, uh, uh, has, has actually become more uh, economically independent in terms of, uh, you know, uh, getting out of the EU, but they're actually more flexible now to work with uh, other countries, so I'm glad to see that uh, UK is joining the uh, CPTPP, which I think UK has an enormous uh, uh, role to play of this global Britain, you know, that uh, can connect in China, connect in uh, Asia, and uh, and also the rest of the world. So there's enormous uh, 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 soft power that UK has in terms of global governance, global relations. So I hope that uh, you know this this UK independence. Where I think uh, President Macron and President, uh, uh, you know, Chancellor Schultz trying to have this European <laughs> strategic independence, UK already has that. So we hope that we can have more uh, uh, collaboration uh, uh, in, in in the years to come with UK. And of course, uh, UK has a, such a great, uh, uh, you know, one of the earliest pioneer of globalization, and so that can really continue uh, the globalization momentum. Uh, now with China uh, added on. So, so I think there's a, a tremendous uh, potential for both countries to collaborate. Angela, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Angela, do you have, uh, do you have some thoughts to share about this question? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, President Wang and President Shao's suggestions are very good because uh, the also Prof, Prof Brown's uh, uh, idea about communications and um, agreements between the two sides are far outweighed conflicts and disagreements. So, I mean, we can seek the common ground and in the future we'd like to publish more books and actually we continue to publish a lot of books on China. We even have a joint venture with Shanghai Century in Beijing. Just now I show one journal, actually it's a collaboration between World Scientific and uh, Shanghai Institute of International Studies. Yeah, indeed, we have quite a lot also from China as well as those from Western countries. Um, I really appreciate Prof. Brown for all those years, always give us support and publish a lot of work with us. I really appreciate because um, nowadays it's the information age. Um, every day people have a lot of information from social media, from traditional media. So what is the correct information? What is a high quality information? So academic words provide this kind of resources. It, it can be verified in history. It record history, it enlightens people. So uh, we feel proud to publish works for uh, great scholars like uh, Prof. Brown. And we also look forward to more collaborations with uh, um, CCG, uh, with uh, China Translation and Publishing House. 
because communication is really important. We can see nowadays the conflicts in Ukraine and also COVID-19, we need a global collaboration. So in this globalization age, even we can't meet each other, we can still connect each other by Zoom, just like today. And today's event, we have publicized through our special China Study Facebook channel and LinkedIn. We hope more people from West can know such kind of events. It's really valuable. And we can have the encounter with our author, Prof. Brown, and also with uh, the top think tank uh, president and uh, top uh, publisher, uh, Shao, President Shao. So it's a great opportunity for us and uh, my player joining all of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Angela. Uh, we have 10 minutes left. Uh, I have a second question from media. Uh, the question is, currently we see that uh, the world is in an era of division. How to forge a partnership between China and the world, especially the European Union, the EU? Who first? Yeah, I mean, one um, idea I, I have is that it, it, in a similar way to uh, how no one has ever put together the key documents from the last 800 years about European views of China. Actually, there's now um, from probably 1980, well, so the Europeans and China diplomatically recognized each other. You, the European Economic Community, the EEC, uh, which existed until it became the European Union in 1993, I think, it diplomatically recognized the People's Republic of China in 1975. And since then, there's been lots of di different documents produced by the Europeans about China. Um, there was important documents in 1985, uh, a trade agreement. There was an important document in the 1990s about strategic relations. Uh, the Chinese also produced white papers, I think five white papers about relations with Europeans uh, over the last 20 years. The Europeans produced uh, important documents about relations with China in 2006, 2016, 2019. And I think um, it will be good to put these all together because again, we don't have a sense of what the context for the current relations between Europe and China are. They actually came from you know, very specific problems uh, they've had a long discussion with each other. I mean, Europe has 80 different dialogues with China from intellectual property rights to food standards to, you know, technical standards. I mean, a lot of these, the UK, despite leaving Europe, is still part of. So these are significant partners. Now, I think um, uh, Dr. Wang or someone mentioned earlier the you know, idea under Macron of France of strategic sovereignty, you know, autonomy. Uh, I mean, Europe wants to have more autonomy in its relations with China. Um, and it has, you know, this specific history, not just the history I've outlined in this book with, with my co-author, uh, Gemma Dung, but also the history since the European Union kind of existed. And I think that would be an important uh, collection of articles too, which which should be done because again, they're all separately, they're all over the place. Some are on websites, some are in books. Um, if you put them together, you basically have a documentary history of this very important relationship between Europe and China, uh, you know, in the world now, between Europe and China, and what the different uh, angles of it are and how it has developed over the last 40 years. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Professor Brown. Do you have something to share? No, I think we, 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 we agree what uh, uh, Carrie just mentioned. I, I think that uh, the EU, uh, European and, and, and China is such a long uh, civilization and that has a lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, things in common. And uh, so, so I think uh, with time, you know, now we are, we are seeing the importance of each other. And I think also now it's a more critical time uh, that we need to strengthen the uh, uh, European-China relations. And uh, also now China's EU largest trading partner and uh, many, many European companies are doing big business in China. So, so I, I, culturally, people-to-people uh, -people exchange and, and count, you know, many things. I, I see two culture, uh, two uh, you know, continents has, has a lot of things in common. And uh, so we should really deepen our understanding 
avoid the conflict and, <laughs> and then you know, play more active roles that to safeguard the world peace and prosperity. Thank you. So the book is about the history, providing a lot of uh, perspectives from a history about the friendship, and some of them are dark moments, and some of them are friendly moments from this 800 years when we are reflecting the history and looking into the future and looking at the present conflicts. It is not uh, new, and um, but it is within our promotion. And uh, we propose that the uh, cultural philosophy or dominancy uh, thoughts has to be abandoned because the world is inclusive. The world is diversified because out of ourselves that there are a lot of other elements and other cultures and civilizations existing uh, waiting for us to communicate and a deepen understanding reciprocally. And uh, this kind of intertwinement uh, between each other is uh, more important. And uh, the harmony of the world should be uh, the mainstream of the world. Thank you. Uh, the third question is from media for uh, Professor Brown. Uh, the question is, uh, John F. Kennedy, the former US president, once said in 1963, let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot, uh, and now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for that, say, make the world safe for diversity. The key words in Kennedy's statement are make the world safe for diversity. In your book, we clearly see that China is different from European countries from a historical perspective. So how today's Europeans to better understand China and its development instead of letting a yellow peril revival feeling fears of China's rise? Yeah, it's a difficult question. Yeah, it's a huge question. I mean, just very briefly, I think we obviously need to study each other more. I mean, I think there's ways in which we need to also study China and what it's doing, rather than always thinking that our way of doing things is better. I think that's just not true. Obviously, it's never been true, and it's definitely not true now. So we have a lot of learning to do as Europeans. I think um, we need to uh, think through more clearly what we, you know, who we are, um, we, we, we need to work our own identity out much more. Um, and I think also, as you've said, accept differences. Some differences are good, of course. So we have to accept differences and accept that um, pluralism and diversity. Thank you. Okay, and uh, it's almost a five o'clock now. So uh, time really fly out very fast. Our Book release will come to an end. Uh, thank you, our distinguished guests, all the distinguished guests, and uh, thank you, uh, dear friends and our audience online. My special thanks and CCG's special thanks goes to Professor Kerry Brown. Thank you for your fascinating book. When you have the plan to write uh, your next book, please keep us yeah, updated once you got the idea. We will try our best to. Uh, published in China. Yeah, we believe Chinese readers will love it. Thank you. And uh, thank you all. And thank you, Angela. Thank you. And uh, hope you can publish, yeah, can uh, cooperate with your publishing house. Yeah, in sure. future. More pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Looking thank you. forward thank to you. it. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.